Good morning, everybody. Um, so as you can see, we're still dealing with some technical issues, but we can introduce ourselves and maybe start in a little bit so we don't uh, get too pressed for time at the back end. Uh, my name is Asaf. I'm the Transgender Youth Project Staff Attorney at the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Uh, NCLR is a national civil rights, LGBT civil rights organization uh, that has been working towards LGBT equality since 1977. Um, and as you can probably tell from my title, the vast majority of work that I do uh, involves representing trans kids uh, in a wide range of legal issues, uh, but largely falls into three buckets, which are schools, uh, access to health care, um, and uh, custody cases involving transgender kids. Hi, my name is Alex Chen. I am um, a colleague of ASAFS at the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and my work there as an attorney uh, primarily centers around uh, advancing the rights of transgender people, including youth, through strategic litigation and policy advocacy. And the work that I do involves cases in uh, schools, as well as in employment, housing, healthcare, uh, prison settings, and the military. So I think our, our goal for today's session is to really provide uh, you all with an overview of what um, discrimination looks like in schools and in public accommodations, uh, as well as some of the sort of legal, the framework uh, around it. Um, but before we do that, I'm curious to get a sense of who's in the room. How many educators are here? Excellent. And how about providers, like mental health medical providers? Excellent. Uh, parents? Awesome. Okay. Well, then I think we should get started. All right. So first, um, before we get started, I wanted to m just make sure that everyone's on the same page and knows what we mean when we refer to these terms and how we use them. Um, so sex assigned at birth is the sex designated to an infant, typically based on an observation of their body. Um, and it's often then put on identity documents such as a birth certificate. A person's gender identity is their core hardwired sense of their sex. Uh, it can be male, it can be female, it can be neither, it can be both. But it is hardwired uh, part of who they are. A person's gender expression is how they express their gender in terms of uh, name, pronouns, hairstyle, uh, clothing, mannerisms. Uh, and so, uh, although they're commonly connected, a person's gender identity and their gender expression may not uh, be, sort of meets what society assumes is stereotypical for that gender identity. A person who's transgender is a person whose sex assigned at birth does not match uh, their gender identity. The next term, transition, is a little bit of a misnomer, um, but uh, when we talk about transition, we're referring to the process by which a transgender person uh, brings their outer appearance into closer alignment with who they are. So it's not that uh, they were male previously and now are female. It's just that they were always female and now their outer appearance is reflecting who they've always been. Um, and as is indicated on the slide, there's kind of three or three sort of stages of that transition, typically. Uh, the social transition refers to uh, name change, clothing, hairstyle, uh, those things. The sort of medical transition often refers to uh, if a child is, for example, going to start taking puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, uh, and may also include surgery. Um, and the legal part is getting court-ordered name and gender marker changes and things like that, uh, changing identity documents. Last thing in terms of terms, we just want to clarify sexual orientation and gender identity are different. A uh, person's sexual orientation is their romantic or sexual attraction to other people or non-attraction to other people. Um, the sort of mnemonic device of sorts that uh, has sort of stuck with me is uh, what is it? It's uh, gender identity is not who you want to go to bed with, but who you want to go to bed as. Um, sort of a, as the sort of difference between the two. Um, one thing that's important in, in this context too, to, I want to talk about a little bit of background about gender identity development and um, the standards of care. 
what we know is that gender that kids become aware of their gender identity somewhere between the ages of two and four years old. So for those educators and mental health providers uh, in the room, you know, if you get a young kid, sit five, six years old, or even younger, it's not, it wouldn't be surprising. It's not that they're too young to know uh, or anything like that. In fact, what we do know is that that's exactly the right age. Obviously, there may be many reasons why a young person or even adult doesn't sort of co come out or identify that they're transgender. There may be family context, social context, or other contexts that, that make that difficult. Um, but we do know, again, that kids become aware, all kids become aware of their gender identity at a young age. Um, then with regards to the standards of care, um, I think it, you know, the main thing to, to take away from the standards of care is that uh, affirming a kid's gender identity is the most critical part of their um, healthy well-being and development. Uh, what we know from the research around family rejection and acceptance is that is the single most determinative factor of a child's short and long-term mental health and well-being. Uh, that goes not only for parents, but also in schools and other areas where young people spend a lot of time. Um, and what those studies show is the higher levels of rejection are correlated with higher levels of uh, negative health outcomes, including uh, suicide attempts, uh, increased substance use, uh, long-term mental health issues, among other negative out health outcomes. And on the flip side, family acceptance is correlated with protective factors, so that a young person who has family acceptance is able to better cope with the discrimination and mistreatment they experience on a daily basis. Um, beyond that, I think it's also important to, to note, just for you all, that regarding the standards of care, that there are no uh, irreversible, fully irreversible uh, treatments until you get to uh, hormone replacement therapy. Um, so social transition is something that is fully reversible. Even puberty blockers, uh, which are medications designed to pause puberty, are fully reversible. Um, and then, you know, with regards, to, you know, there's often a concern about you know, particularly with young kids, that parents are sort of seeking to have them have sur some type of surgery. There are no surgeries that are, med that are part of the standard of care uh, until later adolescence uh, or adulthood. So that's not, just so you know, generally, um, that standard of care. Any questions before we get into the main part of the presentation? All right, excellent, thank you for, all right, schools. So um, we're going to talk about two main topics today, schools and public accommodations, which are actually pretty related to each other. But just based on the amount of interest there usually is in these two topics, we're going to focus the bulk of our presentation on schools, and then we're going to touch on public accommodations at the end. So what I'm going to start by doing here is um, I'm going to walk us through the legal framework that affects the rights of kids in education so you kind of understand the backdrop of you know the framework as a whole and how it applies to trans kids and then we're going to talk about specific types of discrimination that trans kids face and kind of like how to address each of those individually and then what you as you know providers or educators or parents can do about those forms of discrimination so starting off with the legal framework um, there are in this country as we probably all know um, two main sources of legal rights uh, there's the federal law and there's the state law, right? So we live in a federalist system in which both federal law and state law apply. The way that that works in constitutional, in civil rights settings is that the constitution and the federal law provides a floor for the rights that kids have in schools and then states are entitled to enact additional protections for kids on above and beyond the protections that are offered by federal law. Within the federal law, the two main um, sources of protection are the Constitution and uh, federal laws that are passed by Congress, right? So I'm gonna start with federal laws that are passed by Congress because those attach most specifically to schools. The primary law that affects the rights of kids in education is something called Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. And what Title IX says is that every kid um, as covered by it is entitled to uh, have an equal opportunity to access education under the law. Um, and they can't be discriminated against in accessing the education on the basis of several protected characteristics. And that includes things like race, sex, national origin, ethnicity, et cetera. Yeah. Just a quick question. When you say schools, you just mean lower education or Okay, that's a really great question. So Title IX covers any educational institution, um, K through 12 or 
uh, university as long as the entity receives public funds. So that covers all you know public schools that are run by the state, but it also covers actually a large number of um, private universities and quite a number of private K through 12 schools as long as they receive some kind of federal funding. That's how liability attaches under Title IX. If um, the primary instance in which it usually doesn't attach is that there are some private religious schools, especially K through 12 schools, that don't receive any federal funds, in which case Title IX wouldn't apply. Um, so Title IX has, as I said, these different protected c categories, um, and the way that that you know, works when it comes to trans kids is that the sex discrimination category has been widely interpreted by many courts to include discrimination on the basis of transgender status. And that isn't just in the education context, right? There's a lot of cases in employment um, and in other contexts as well that have also held that basically when you discriminate against somebody on the basis of sex, it's discrimination on the basis of transgender status. And there's a couple of different ways that the courts have explained why that is. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think the primary two ways that they've explained that are, number one, um, that there's a whole line of cases about basically why stereotyping people on the basis of gender is a type of sex discrimination, right? So there's a very landmark Supreme Court case from the 1980s called Price Waterhouse, and in that case what happened was there was a woman who was a, um, working at a financial services firm in Houston, um, and she didn't make partner. And um, even though she was really exemplary and she did really well and everybody said that she was a shoe in she didn't make partner. And the reason that the company gave for not making her partner is that they said that she was too mannish. Um, and so she sued them for sex discrimination. And their defense in court was, we didn't discriminate against her because she was a woman. We just thought she was too mannish. So it wasn't about her being a woman per se. It's just that she acted in a way that we didn't like. And what the Supreme Court said is that is a false distinction. If you're saying that somebody is too mannish, you have this gender-based stereotype of how she was supposed to behave based on being a woman. And she didn't act that way, and you didn't like that, and that's why you discriminated against her. And that's a violation of you know, federal employment discrimination laws, saying you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. And what has happened is that courts have looked at that precedent, and they've said, well, that also applies when it comes to transgender people. right? If you um, are discriminating against a transgender person, what's going on is that you think that this person is, for example, a man but they're acting like a woman and you don't like that. And so you have a gender-based stereotype about how they ought to act based on what you think their sex is, and that's why you're discriminating against them. So that's one way that they've talked about it. Another way is just to say, if you're discriminating against somebody because they're trans, there's no way in which you aren't thinking about a sex-related characteristic, right? You're thinking about something about their sex or their gender or what you think it is or what it ought to be, and therefore you can't get away from the fact that it's a form of sex discrimination. So both ways of thinking about it have been widely adopted by many federal courts um, in multiple different contexts because there's a lot of different laws in our country that say that you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. And so um, this is a pretty robust framework that has already been established and recognized by multiple federal courts um, across the country. And of course, it's also been applied in the context of education to say that when you discriminate against a transgender student, that is also sex discrimination. I will say at this point that you know one thing that a lot of you might have heard is that there's been a lot of controversy over the federal government rescinding some guidance that they had in which they basically had that legal position, right? So during the Obama administration, the Department of Justice and the Department of Education put out some like guidance saying, we think that that makes sense and we agree with this interpretation of the law. And what this new administration has done is that they've rescinded those guidances and they've gone back and said, we don't agree with that anymore. We don't think that Title IX does cover trans kids. Um, the reason why that isn't as bad as it sounds, <laughs> although it is not great that they did that, is that their doing that by and of itself does not change what courts rule, right? So courts have already made these rulings, and those rulings don't get erased just because the government doesn't agree with them. The judiciary is a different component of our constitutional system than the federal government, and so all of those court rulings saying that trans kids are protected by Title IX still stand. Um, and in fact, we are continuing to win these cases under this administration as well, and so we have, we're cautiously optimistic that you know, this body of law is going to remain. The second form of federal statutory protection is disability-related laws, including things like the Americans with Disability Act and the um, Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, the IDEA. So the way that this has been sometimes considered to work is that uh, it protects trans kids who have another kind of disability in the sense that if they have another kind of disability and they have an IEP, their gender dysphoria should be taken into account. But also, there have been a couple of court cases that have held that gender dysphoria in it's of itself as a medical diagnosis, um, if it constitutes a significant impairment on you know, a person's life functioning, can also constitute a type of disability discrimination. The other source of main prote protection under federal law is the Constitution. Um, there, the main source of protection that we have for kids is uh, the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. So under the Equal Protection Clause, um, it says that you know, everybody's entitled to equal protection under the law. 
And what the Supreme Court has held that means is that if you discriminate on the basis of certain protected characteristics, like, again, like things like race or sex, you have to give that special scrutiny because we have a long history of those kinds of discrimination in our country. So we have to be really suspicious that if the state is acting on the basis of those categories, that's a problem. So this would apply in any situation in which the state is acting. So any state, you know, university or state school, public school. Um, and again, we have had a number of cases in the education context saying that discrimination against trans students is either a form of sex discrimination, which means you get a lot of scrutiny, or that trans transgender status is another protected category because transgender people have historically been really discriminated against. So again, if a school makes a policy which singles out or targets trans kids, we have to be really suspicious that it's not coming from you know like a legitimate place. It's really just coming from animus or discrimination. And we're going to look at it really closely and see whether they have a really good reason for doing that and whether they could do it some other way that doesn't discriminate against trans kids. Uh, another couple of um, constitutional, you know, doctrines that protect trans kids um, include, you know, under the First Amendment, the right to free speech and free expression, which um, has been held to mean, for example, that you can't have laws in like Puerto Rico that say that you can never change your identity documents. Um, and also, uh, there are privacy protections within the Constitution as well um, that protect the, you know, the privacy of sort of sensitive personal information, including things like transgender status. And as Alex mentioned at the, at the beginning of his talk about the legal framework, states can then sort of offer additional protections to, to trans people as well as uh, any other person they want. And uh, many uh, or an increasing number of states have specific protections at the state level uh, that include gender identity. That um, And so that would, again, explicitly provide protections at the state level. Uh, Washington being one of them. Uh, there's also many more states prohibit sex discrimination in a wide range of places, including schools and public accommodations. And uh, a lot of states look to the way that federal law has been interpreting sex, uh, which includes gender identity. And so there is certainly a possibility that even if uh, th that that provides sort of additional protections as well as disability protections. And I realize one thing that's not on the slide is that state their states also have their own constitutions, which can also provide, much like the, the protections at the federal level, uh, can also provide protections at the state level. Um, and there are some state constitutions, particularly around issues of privacy, that are even stronger than the federal constitution. Yeah, and one other thing I'll just add is that one thing that states can do with that power is that they can be more specific about what constitutes discrimination. Because as we're about to talk about, you know, the next question is, okay, you can't discriminate on the basis of transgender status, but what does that mean? For example, California has a law that says that, you know, you can't, uh, that you have to allow trans kids to participate in all sex-separated sports and activities at school consistent with their gender identity, right? So that's an example of a law that fleshes out what it means to discriminate and explains that that particular kind of discrimination is not allowed. Right. Went one slide too far. <coughs> all right, so, um, we came up with a list of kind of common issues that come up in schools and talking about how, uh, and we'll, we'll sort of go through each of these and talk about how, uh, what, what a school's obligation are under these, um, in these particular areas. Um, and obviously, again, please feel free to ask questions as they come to you. Um, so the first and most common one we get is about a student's transition. What are the school's obligations uh, regarding a student's transition? And if a school's not supporting a student's transition, they're violating, at a minimum, Title IX and federal law. Uh, and there may be state laws that they're violating as well, because what they're saying to the transgender student is that, you know, we're not going to respect your gender identity. We're not going to come up with a plan for ensuring that when you come to school, you feel safe and supported and able to learn. And so what, what, what it looks like uh, if a school was to sort of fully comply with those obligations, is meeting with the student and depending on their age or the situation, maybe also their parents, to figure out what exactly this young person needs to feel safe and comfortable in school. This meeting is not about sort of, you know, let me tell you what, you know, what options I'll give you. It's here are all the options, let's figure out what works. Um, and it's really important that to the extent you are educators or are gonna be involved in this process, not to sort of in, impose concerns that you may have about what's gonna happen if something happens. It's really about giving options and helping the, the, the family and the young person decide what is best for them. Um, 
So what you know, one example could be is saying, look, you know, you can have access to the boys' restroom or you know whatever restroom is consistent with your gender identity, or if you don't feel comfortable using the communal restrooms, you can use uh, <coughs> the single stall restroom that we have in the school. For, or if you want to, for changing for physical education, we can provide you sort of an alternate changing schedule so that you feel comfortable changing. But all these are all options that are available to you. You tell us what works for you. And then you can kind of navigate um, what's gonna work for this particular student because what works for this student is not, not necessarily gonna work for other students. There are gonna be lots of similarities, but it's still important to go through that process so that uh, the student and their parents feel like they have a chance to sort of tailor things uh, to, to what fits them. Yeah, and I'll just say on that before I go into names and pronouns that I think the, the, the most important thing about kind of like the way to think about this is, is there something about the student being transgender which is having an effect on their ability to thrive at school, right? Is there something about how other people are treating them or how they're experiencing the school environment that is causing them to be unable to fully access their educational opportunities because they're distracted or anxious or stressed out or scared because of something to do with their transgender status? And if that's the, the case, then the school has an obligation to do something to change the school environment so that this student can feel comfortable learning at school, right? And so I think that's kind of like the, kind of the lodestar of all this, right? And all of the things that we're gonna talk about specifically are kind of like manifestations of that and why it is that not, for example, using the right names and pronouns will distract that student from being able to learn. But that's really, I think, the framework to think about this, especially for educators, right, that like, you know, the educational institution's responsibility and the educator's responsibility is to give students that ability to learn at school and that what's going on when you discriminate against transgender students, why it is discrimination, is that they aren't able to actually do that. They're unable to be at school on the level playing field with everybody else. So on names and pronouns, I mean, that flows quite nicely into that. I mean, so first of all, I will say one thing that we often hear and is absolutely not true is the school does not have a legal obligation to use the legal name of the student until such time as the student has a legal name or gender marker change, right? So the school does have a legal obligation to know what the student's legal name and gender marker is and to keep a record of that. And there are certain reporting requirements with the state. But that doesn't mean that in the school environment, when it comes to things like the roll call, the register, using the kid's name in class, that those situations, they can't use the kid's le le preferred uh, you know, name and the, the, the pronoun with which they identify, right? So oftentimes, the holdup is sort of more administrative, that they don't have that implemented in their systems. But there is no legal reason why they have to do that. And conversely, not using a student's name and pronoun that they identify with carries a lot of risks for the student, right? especially if they haven't disclosed. Um, it could out the student really easily. We have had many different situations where things like some other kid looked up the roll call and found out you know, what this kid's legal name was, or a substitute came to school and didn't know that this is the name that the kid goes by. But also, even if the kid is known to be transgender, using you know, a pronoun and a name they don't identify with undermines their legitimacy of their name and pronoun to their peers, right? And to them as well. It causes you know, psychic stress and anxiety to the child, but also it causes other students to not take their identity seriously, and that opens them up to more bullying and harassment. So actually, although names and pronouns might seem like not a big deal, they're actually one of the most critical things um, in affirming a student and making sure that they are able to feel comfortable at school. And I think it's it. oh, go ahead. <coughs> So, I mean, there are some situations with things like transcripts, for example, um, where there are things like FAFSA reporting requirements, or there might be state reporting requirements, where you know they might not be able to correct like a graduation certificate or a transcript or something until after there was a legal name change. But as you said, that doesn't typically apply for anything that is outward facing, like a library card or you know something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think, too, going to your other point is we, for, from our perspective, best practices is to maintain that file it, that has the student's legal name and gender as it appears on their birth certificate in a separate uh, secure location mm -hmm. so that it's not, you know, a teacher 
a high school teacher can sort of look through all the records and leaf through, see how they did, you know, five years ago before they transition, and see, you know, their prior name or, or anything like that. So I think that's also it's important to think through those issues. Uh, for example, if the there's some school districts that sort of staple a picture of the student throughout the years, you know, like those things are things to think about to make sure that the kid doesn't get get outed um, I indirectly. And I think that. Uh, ties nicely with school records, um, and I think it's really important to think uh, sort of thoroughly about about school records and where you know many school districts use student information systems that maintain all sorts of data about the student, um, and many of these student information systems are uh, adaptable, um, and so it's really important to to figure out how you can adapt. The student information system that your district uses or that district uses to um, maintain both the student's uh, legal name and their chosen name and identified pronouns. And there are some systems that can maintain it just as sort of in the background where everything forward facing is in the correct information. It's still important though to know what that sort of background information where that gets, what, what's that, if that's ever used to populate something else. So for example, in some cases, that information is then uploaded to the state sort of database of students, and it's the state database of students that's used to print out testing booklets for state testing. And so it's important to sort of think through, you know, are there other vendors or someone else who's gonna use that background, or get access to that background information, because they're entitled to that access for, you know, reporting requirements, but may ultimately come back to our students and cause problems. Uh, picture day is another one, where the sort of the photographers who are brought in for picture day are given access to sort of that background information, uh, not necessarily the sort of generally front-facing information. And so it's critical to think through how the how the school district maintains records, what they maintain, and how people get access to them uh, to prevent. Um, uh, to prevent disclosure. And I think, uh, you know, with a lot of these things, unfortunately, folks who haven't done this work or aren't, you know, aren't familiar with, with trans people in general sort of say, well, okay, what's the big deal if their legal name appears on these records? Uh, you know, other than sort of undermining their identity, which is very significant, it can actually cause other problems. It's something that may seem small but can snowball uh, one of the clients that, that, I, that I represented uh, before starting at NCLR, uh, one of his classmates saw his gender marker on roll call and she took a picture of it and out of it on Facebook to the entire school. And after that, he started getting bullied and harassed. And when the school district didn't properly address <laughs> the bullying and harassment, one day he got fed up and he fought back. And when he fought back, he got expelled <coughs> and he got charged with assault. And so from that, what seem, that seemingly small, you know, his, the school attendance sheet wasn't correct, snowballed into him being expelled and having a, potentially having a criminal record. Um, so these are not small things. And I think it is really important uh, to the extent you run into folks who don't understand that is to really tell these stories that demonstrate that, yes, it may seem small, like particularly with access to the restrooms. That's one we get. So what's the big deal? You just go and you do your business, you come out. Uh, it does have a very uh, significant effect. Um, and then I guess lastly, just point out privacy is a huge issue. One thing to just make clear is that students ha control that right, right? Uh, students have that right to privacy. And uh, just because they're disclosing to their friends that they're trans does not mean that you can, right? You can only disclose that information uh, if you're given permission to do that. Um, and so it's really important to, uh, to make sure that what the school is doing I is going to ensure that, that that flow of information is solely controlled by the student or their family. And just one last point on that, that often what we'll hear is that people have this idea that they have, quote, unquote, a right to know whether other people are transgender. And generally speaking, that's not correct. But within the school, this school setting, it's even more incorrect. In fact, no other parent has the right to private medical information about any other kid that isn't their kid, right? And so, you know, just like the school could not go around disclosing that this kid had diabetes and this kid had autism, they cannot go around disclosing that another kid has, um, you know, is transgender. Of course, 
perhaps the, the, the school, you know, the student themselves or their parents together with the student might decide that the best thing for them to do is disclose. But as Asaf said, that information is absolutely within their control, their decision-making authority. And the school doesn't have the right to disclose that to other parents in the school. And in fact, you know, not, not even teachers within the school necessarily have a right to know that information unless it's actually relevant to, you know, for them to know that for some reason. Which is gonna be a very, very rare instance. I, I really, I've thought long and hard about this for many years and I have not come up with an instance where it's become, where, where, where it's relevant. Um, and so to, to the extent that you feel like you're in a position where you have to disclose, I would encourage you all to, to talk to the student first and give them the opportunity and resources to make the disclosure themselves if you absolutely feel like it's necessary. Um, and I would suggest that you should only, that it's only necessary if it's in order to safeguard the trans kids' mental health and well-being. Um. So um, the next topic, access to sex segregated facilities such as restrooms or locker rooms is um, something that you know has engendered a lot of public attention, a lot of public debate and discussion. Um, what I, I think I wanted to highlight on this topic is two things. The first thing is, as Asaf mentioned, how critical it is for students to be able to access facilities that they can use safely, right? Um, we have a lot of evidence that when students feel like they can't go to the bathroom safely, they hold it, they, they develop urinary problems that can be very medically serious. Um, they, it's very distracting, like if you've ever tried to like just not go to the bathroom all day, which is what happens to a lot of trans kids, they say, oh, it's not a big deal, I don't need to go to the bathroom, right? Like it's like a basic you know, human function that they're not performing and it can be tremendously distracting and have a really bad effect on their ability to succeed at school. It also is something that singles them out from other students, right? If everybody else is just going to, you know, the like boys or girls restrooms or locker rooms and you're the only kid who isn't, that's gonna raise questions. And the very fact that you are afraid of that is gonna cause you to have to like do things like hide it or hold it or run away from other people. And so it can have this like really big effect on your life. Just think about how many times a day you go to the bathroom and think about every single one of those times being something that's fraught with anxiety. And that's a situation that a kid is in if they don't feel safe with the facilities that they're using. Go ahead. Sure, that's a good question. Um, and I think the way I'll answer that, if it's okay with you, is I'll talk a little bit about the some big cases that are out there on this issue. Um, so there are two kinds of lawsuits around bathrooms that are the primary like genres of lawsuits. The first kind is um, a trans student is at school and they wanna use facilities consistent with their gender identity and are not being permitted to use those facilities. Um, there, you know, there have been actually a number of very good cases that have come out in the federal courts, both on the circuit level, which is the level right below the Supreme Court, and on the, d the trial or district level, that have affirmed the right of a trans kid to use, um, especially most of these cases have been about around bathrooms, um, consistent with their gender identity, right? And so one that I encourage you all to look into if you want a really good authority on this is a case that's called Whitaker v. Kenosha School District in the Seventh Circuit. Um, and yeah, Whitaker. You know, we should put it up. Next time we'll, yeah. we'll put it up. But it's called Whitaker, W-H-I-T-A-K-E-R. And that case is really important for two reasons. One is that it comes out of the Seventh Circuit, which is a really influential um, and conservative court of appeals that covers like some Midwestern states, including like Indiana and Illinois and Michigan and places like that. So it is considered to be like both like very respected by other circuits and it's seen as like not as liberal as some of the coastal circuits. So the fact that it's come out in favor of this trans kid has been very significant. This case came out last year. And the other reason that the case is really important is because the school really thoroughly analyzed all these arguments people use for like why trans kids shouldn't be allowed to use the facility of their choice, right? And the, and the school did, and the, the opinion says, look, um, you know, everybody understands that, you know, these public facilities like restrooms are places of limited privacy, but there's no reason that a trans kid being in those facilities with somebody is any more violative of anybody's privacy than a, like a student from another, uh, of the same, you know, who's also cisgender and of the same gender and is also like is sneaking at people, right? And we have no evidence, first of all, that trans kids are even doing that. But even to the extent that they did, you know, everybody might be taking a look and everybody kind of understands that. And there's nothing inherently more harmful about a trans kid doing it than a cisgender kid. The, you know, the court also recognizes, look, between, if you have like, you know, a single stall option and then you have a, you know, um, like a mixed stall facility, if a cisgender student is uncomfortable but with a trans kid being there, the cisgender kid can go use the single sex stall. And in fact, it's less uh, bad for that because 
a cisgender kid using a single sex doll is not going to get singled out for doing it. They're not going to be like, why did you go to the gender neutral stall? It's not going to have the same harm that it does to a trans kid. Because if you put a trans kid and say, you can't go into the boys facility, you have to go into the gender neutral <laughs> facility, then it's going to brand them as not really being legitimately of that gender in a way that isn't going to be the case with a cis kid. So the court really had a very like nuanced and understanding view of like the ways in which this will operate differently as a burden upon trans kids or cis kids to be the one to elect to use that single stall facility and said, look, you know, as long as the school provides these options for the person who feels uncomfortable to go off and use that stall, that's okay. And the burden should be on the cis kid to do that, not the trans kid, right? So that um, opinion was very important. Yeah. I don't want to interrupt this, but while we're on the topic of precedent, so I provide training to schools, and it's interesting. The high schools go, oh yeah, everybody needs that restroom, no problem. It's actually when I'm training the elementary at the youngest level, they're like, how am I going to do that? So the kindergarten and first grade teachers, they will take all students to the restroom and as a group go to the restroom, and their students don't necessarily navigate like their pants buttons very well or things like that. Don't have dexterity, so oftentimes they're telling me, okay, but I've got students coming to me half naked. So how do we, when we have students who have different genitals, um, navigate that restroom? And that's where I've not been able to really like offer some support because their concerns really is not, oh, somebody's going to be peeking or somebody's going to be inappropriate, but how do we support the privacy of all of these students when they can't button their pants very well, for example? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm taking all students, so all boys over here, all girls over here, we're monitoring everybody because we've got very young students. And I didn't really have an answer for that, and maybe you don't either, but I wanted to kind of push back. Yeah, yeah, that's the only case. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I haven't heard that that particular situation come up in the, in the context of young kids, but I, I think in, in that context, I mean, they can at least pull up their underwear. Sure. And, and so I think beyond that, I mean, I, I think w one of the, the sort of critical things that I think that situation kind of points to is that generally speaking around restrooms, people have a lot of anxiety. Um, and as educators and administrators and people who work with schools, the, the, the key thing around uh, access to sex separated facilities and also activities is to talk about what those fears are. Right, and to really kind of get as granular as possible and, and find out, you know, because I think a lot of it is, you know, uh, like these teachers are, we're totally happy doing that, but how do we implement it? And sort of really sort of thinking about, you know, one of the common questions we used to get is like, what if the kid looks under the stall? You know, uh, well, if the kid looks under a stall, that's a problem, not because there's a trans kid in there, but because kids shouldn't be looking under the stalls. And so really sort of talking to them about, you know, what this means on a practical level. But I think, in, in that case, it seemed, you know, just to have sort of some shared agreements about, look, I'm happy to help you with your buttons or your zippers or things like that, but you need to pull up your underwear. Yeah. And, and that way, you know, even if they come out of the stall with their, you know, pants around their ankles, you know, there, there's not going to be, um, th there's not going to be a, a sort of issue. But I think also, you know, it's important to prepare teachers for everything that could happen. And so let's say one, one time a trans girl comes out of the, the stall with her underwear and pants around her ankles, I think then it opens up the possibility for a conversation, right? Assuming that anyone notices, right? Uh, or that it becomes a sort of topic of discussion to talk about in, in an age appropriate way, talk about what gender identity is and all that kind of thing. I think the reality is though, uh, as many of you probably know, that a trans kid is very unlikely to do that. Um, just because of, of how they feel about their body um, in general. Yeah, and sorry, go ahead. And, and also, how would that be different than a non trans kid necessarily that everybody goes to the bathroom that they feel comfortable to go on or is discussed at? I don't know, I, <coughs> I'm confused too about, and, and maybe you are too. <laughs> Well, it, it, it sounds like they're worried about cis girls seeing trans girls' genitals. Oh, is, really? is that's, that's really, really, really. And being like, how does this girl not have what I have? Okay. And and I think how do I, not me, but how does this teacher who's experiencing some discomfort and some anxiety yeah. around the topic now have to address the topic that they're already uncomfortable yeah. with with their students? <coughs> now they do so at an age appropriate yeah. level. Yeah. The, 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 there, 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 there is a good book called uh, From the Dress Up Corner to the Prom. Uh, uh, from, I think it's From the Dress Up Corner to the Prom. 
Um, and it's uh, Jennifer Bryant is, I believe, the, the author. Um, and it's a, it's a great book that provides really sort of practical lessons and things like that, how to talk about uh, these issues. And I would also recommend, I'm sure Aiden here at Gender Odyssey has a bunch and Gender Spectrum has a bunch as well, uh, ways for, for how kindergarten and young, you know, elementary school educators can talk about these issues. I think what's interesting is that uh, Glisten did a study a number of years ago about the sort of preparedness of uh, elementary school educators to talk about these issues and found, uh, unfortunately, that they were wholly unprepared and they felt very nervous about it and I think that's what you're seeing. Uh, Another thing that we sometimes recommend is, you know, to encourage people to take the trans out of it. So imagine mm -hmm. that what they saw wasn't somebody's genitals, but that some kid had um, a brace or that they had some kind of like monitor on their body for a medical reason. And other kids were like, what's that? I don't have that. How would you have a respectful conversation with them about, you know, not singling people out and treating people equally and fairly in the classroom? Like, I mean, try and summon resources that they feel like they do have as educators to mediate conflict between children and to increase classroom acceptance and see if they can sort of think about it with that framework rather than allowing anxiety around transgender people to be what's at the forefront of their minds. <laughs> yeah. Is there time for another question? Yeah, sure. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So I work in a school where um, primary grades were on the bottom floor, very common, and then intermediate and upper grades were on the upper floor. So we have a third grade um, student who is in transition, and he and you know, his parents went to all the classrooms on the upper floor and talked about gender identity and expression of the fact that he was in transition. So my question is, is it discriminatory to have the student use the restroom on the upper floor um, as opposed to the bottom floor? Well, I guess, I guess the, the, the question, I would turn it back and say, what does the student want? And, and you know, because there may be, you know, again, w as schools, it's the idea is to offer options. And so if this kid, for example, you could have a trans student who, you know, just does not want to use the communal restroom, just feels much more comfortable in a single stall, even though it's very far from their classrooms, right? So if it's this student's choice that they're using the, the restrooms in, in, uh, in the upper floors, upper floor, that's a choice that you should allow them to make. But you, I think it's important to make clear to them, you should make clear to them that they have access to, to the, the restrooms consistent with their gender identity on the floor where their classes are. Right, exactly, and so the student may be, feel more comfortable using those restrooms upstairs because of their, their experience of going around to the classrooms and, and sort of identifying themselves as, as transgender. Uh, and it may be because those students have seen this, the student through their transition, so they may be you know, confused or they might ask questions. Or, and I think that's another thing to sort of talk about with the student is like, Who's going to field those questions? Sometimes kids feel super comfortable doing that, and sometimes they don't. And so it's important as administrators and educators to be prepared to step in and, you know, sort of taking the trans out of it. It's like if you had a kid uh, with cancer going through chemotherapy, you know, the last thing you this kid probably wants is tons of kids coming up to them and be like, why'd your hair fall out? Where have you been? You know, what, you know all those questions that are totally understandable, innocent questions for kids to ask, but this kid may not feel like they have the resources and, and sort of brain space to answer them. Um, and so it'd be good for the adults to, to sort of be prepared to talk about those issues in a way that's gonna be respectful to the kid. Yeah, and I would say two, just two quick things. Like one is that I think, kind of in line with what Asaf is saying, that this might be an opportunity for you as an educator to think about whether you as a school system have a good policy for dealing with transgender students in general, rather than, you know, maybe this is the way that this particular kid and their parents wanted to deal with the situation, but even with that kid, this issue is liable to come up again and again because students don't stay on the same floor, you know, every year, and new students come into the school and students get older and change, you know, where they're gonna go to class, and so, you know, do you have a more comprehensive policy in place to deal with the situation, and, you know, does, does that policy sort of like meet the needs of other trans kids that might be coming through your system as well? And the other thing I would say about, you know, what Asaf said about options is that this comes up, can come up especially in the case of non-binary kids who don't feel comfortable using, you know, either the boys' facilities or the girls' facilities because they feel like either way they're going to get singled out. Um, 
I think which again highlights the need for the school to be thinking about this more holistically in terms of like, well, what does the school student need to feel comfortable? Does this student need to feel comfortable? You know, do they need actually to have access to more single stall restrooms so that they can feel like they can go to a place that's safe for them? And in sort of instead of saying, well, you just have to pick one, right? If that's not something which is meeting the needs of that child. So just briefly to touch on the other aspect of cases involving sex segregated facilities, the other branch of cases that have kind of arisen is like cases where cisgender students have s like sued schools that have enacted trans inclusive policies, right? And so there are some religious right groups that are currently going around encouraging the school districts to either not implement these policies or encouraging parents to sue on the behalf of their kids if a school does implement a trans inclusive policy and say that basically a, a trans inclusive policy violates the privacy rights of the cisgender kids. Um, those claims have been almost universally rejected by every court that has um, entertained those claims. And the most recent prominent example of that is a case called Doe v. Boyertown um, in the Third Circuit, circuit um, which was about a school district in Pennsylvania that enacted a trans-inclusive policy. That's Boyertown, B-O-Y-E-R-T-O-W-N. And again, you know what the court said in that case is, look, cisgender students don't have this inherent privacy right just to not be near the bodies of like transgender people, right? It just you don't have a right to like not even the mere presence of a transgender person doesn't violate your privacy rights just because of whatever genitals they have. And again, you know, taking a lot of the analysis from the Whitaker case saying, look, again, you know, the school district here was really thoughtful. They provided a lot of options. You know, if anybody was uncomfortable about that situation with trans kids being in the bathroom, cisgender kids could come go to the administrator and say, I don't feel comfortable with this. They could be given um, accommodations around single stop bathrooms. And so, you know, like as long as the school district is really thoughtful about this and make sure that everyone's discomfort is, is, is heard and accommodated in some way without prejudicing the rights of the transgender students either, then there's nothing wrong with this policy and it's okay. This case is currently up before the Supreme Court um, on review, like they filed for the Supreme Court to review it. The Supreme Court has not agreed to review it. And we feel fairly confident that the Supreme Court is not gonna come in here and invent a new privacy right, not least because it's a pretty conservative court. Some conservative courts don't historically invent new privacy rights, so we're not too worried about it. But that is another kind of case that's out there. And what I wanted to mention about the locker rooms is that that case involved both the bathroom policy and a locker room policy. So we haven't had a really major case um, involving a trans student seeking locker rooms just yet, but we have had cases where the school has implemented a locker room policy and it's withstood judicial review. Yeah. A lot of the uh, court cases that are involving LGBT or gay and not just trans uh, are, um, they're argued uh, on um, equal access and equal protection grounds, but a lot of the courts, for, uh, a lot of the legislation that's uh, coming through now today and being argued even in, in court involves uh, legal, um, uh, religious freedom. And I'm, I've always been curious why that's never been brought up on the affirming side as the, you know, if you're coming from, we'll say, a uh, fundamental Christian standpoint and saying you can't exercise your religious freedom because these trans or LGBT people are involved, why not um, coming back and fighting that with um, our religious freedom is being um, interrupted because you're trying to push yours on us. Can we just hold yeah. that question because we're actually going to talk about that in the context of the public accommodation cases. Yeah. And if you still have questions after that, we can we can talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we should probably move a little bit faster <laughs> just, to, <laughs> yeah. just uh, to keep on timing. But I, you know, I don't I don't think there's much to add to. I mean, I, just to be aware that there are other sex separated activities and and programs. For example, sometimes schools separate sex ed by by sex, sports, um, you know, prom, graduation. Thinking about all these things like you know, uh, black robes for boys and white robes for girls and sort of thinking about how that can play out for kids and making, making ideally gender neutral, uh, a gender neutral tradition, uh, <coughs> but it's certainly ensuring if there is a sex separated tradition that trans kids get to participate consistent with their gender identity. Uh, you know, and I think just like with uh, facilities, there's lots of anxiety around sports about, you know, there's this belief that a school is going to be able to field uh, a t an entire team of transgender girls who, you know, just started their transition and therefore going to be able to dominate sports. That's never happened, uh, ever. And um, you know, Washington was actually the first state to allow trans kids to compete based on gender identity. They did that in 2008, and they've literally had a handful of students in the <coughs> nearly in the decade since they adopted that policy. And I think it's also important to to recognize that. 
people have, you know, we, we think about this idea that, that men are better at sports or can dominate women's sports. And really what that obscures is that there's a lot of difference among men and among women in athletic ability. Um, and there may be some people just have very natural athletic ability. For example, I love to play soccer. No matter how hard I train, I will never be better than any of the women on the US women's soccer team. My athletic ability does not compare. And that's just a reality. And so there may be, you may have a transgender student who has a lot of athletic ability and they would excel in their sport regardless of whether or not they're competing consistent with their sex assigned at birth or their gender identity. Um, and so, you know, th that's just the, the reality of it. And so, you know, uh, you know, there, there is a lot of anxiety about it, but I would encourage you all to sort of, again, sort of think and try and figure out, w pinpoint what that anxiety is uh, and, and address it. And the concern, for example, is safety. Well, we can't make, you know, want to make sure that all the athletes are safe. Well, then there's a problem with the rules of the game. If you can't keep all students safe, there, you need to change the rules of the game to ensure that all students, that all people who are playing can be safe. And one last thing I'll add about sports is, again, to like take it out of this like this competitive mindset and think about like why do we have sports at school? Mm -hmm. We have sports at school so that children can participate in competition and they can learn things like sportsmanship and you know fair play. And really, the idea is to get kids moving and active, right, and get them away from video games. And so those things are really like what we should be focused on, on and making sure that kids are included in that so that they get the benefits of that kind of physical activity, right? And just speaking personally as a trans person, like I didn't recognize how much like not being allowed to really participate in things like sports the way that I wanted to had like a really big effect on my life and my health until like much later in life, right? Until like I got to a place where I was comfortable with my body but also felt like I could participate in these like sex segregated systems the way that I wanted to. And a lot of trans kids, they're missing out on these more profound sort of like social benefits of being integrated into things like sports, right? It's a way to make friends. It's a really important part of American national life and culture. Um, and th just like things like access to the military, right, it has this kind of like dignitary effect as well to be able to participate. And so I think it's something that people take too lightly and they think it's not a big deal. But actually it's really bad for kids' health not to be able to participate in sports. It's bad for their ability to integrate socially. So just something to think about. On dress codes, very briefly, uh, due to a really crappy line of cases, my opinion, not NCLRs, just my personal opinion, uh, it's okay to have dress codes that are sex segregated in virtually every aspect of American life, including schools. But again, what you can't do is discriminate against trans kids in that context. If you have a dress code that separates on the basis of sex, those kids should be able to pick, according to their gender identity, you know, what they're gonna dress as. Uh, and then bullying and harassment. I think we've talked a lot about a lot of the sort of examples, meaning, you know, intentionally misgendering a student, whether it's a, uh, a teacher or another student, um, you know, do, you know, using language that uh, is intended to demean the transgender student. We can think of probably, unfortunately, many, many ways to do that. Um, it could also be physical violence. It could be, um, uh, you know, relational aggression. It, it can really come out in many different ways, but the idea is that, you know, the student is being targeted uh, for who they are. Um, and what's critical is that uh, schools take steps to address it, uh, you know, under, Title IX, schools are not liable for the fact that it happens, but they are liable for their failure to respond appropriately. Um, and I think that, that is an important distinction. So you mentioned earlier, yeah. and you talked about this, I think, uh, transgender um, right. policies. Um, but I've had a lot of problem where our school has a beautiful anti-bullying and anti-harassment policy that I'm sure, I, I believe ABC um, was a part of developing the model policy. So I think, you know, what, what that sort of goes to, unfortunately, is that um, anti-discrimination laws, they don't require perfection, they require compliance. They don't require policies or training or anything, they just require compliance. And so you can have a really great policy, which it sounds like this particular district does, but the key thing is then training 
the people who are going to implement that policy about what it means. And so, you know, it, you know, training, doing trainings about what harassment looks like, it does look like outing, it does, you know, and these are the ways that it happens, and these are the things that we expect in terms of, you know, how you respond in those situations, you know, that's where even the best of policies can fall short. Uh, yeah, and, and that, that's a, uh, you know, unfortunately, teachers have a very li limited number of, you know, professional development days and all those kinds of things, and so it does unfortunately get crunched, um, but, but that's where these policies, unfortunately, often fail. Quickly touch yeah. on. Yeah, so I think the, just quickly, the, the mental or physical health interfering, this is really about uh, transgender kids who have co-occurring conditions that require them to have an IEP or a Section 504 plan. If you have a student like that, as um, Alex mentioned earlier, it's really critical to make sure that their entire plan affirms their gender identity and every aspect of it affirms their gender identity because they're not going to be getting the benefits of those services if they aren't. Uh, for example, one of the first clients I represented uh, as a lawyer uh, was a young girl who was uh, deaf and hard of hearing and, her sp and she required speech and language therapy as a result. Her speech and language therapist refused to use her correct name and pronouns. So she's not getting any benefit from that speech and language therapy until that happens. And so it's really critical to make sure that the IEP makes clear that the student's gender identity needs to be affirmed in all aspects of their program and ensuring to the extent they're using um, vendors to provide services to this young person that they too are going to be affirming. Because not only is it going to mean that uh, the student's not going to get any benefit from it, uh, but it could also mean liability in the context of, you know, denial of services, and also schools that receive federal funds cannot aid or abet discrimination, and that is what you're doing as a school district by contracting with someone who is discriminating against a student or someone else and not doing anything about it. Um, and I guess lastly, just uh, with parents who don't affirm their kids, this is a really difficult area. Um, but what we encourage schools to do is in those situations meet with the young person just to let them know that you are that you want to make sure that they feel comfortable and safe in school and talk to them about what that can look like even though their parents are not affirming uh, and if it's and if it's what the student wants maybe even talk about how you can help bring the parents on board I think one of the great things about being in the position of, of educators or even providers is that you're sort of a neutral third party you're there because you love and care for the kids and you want to see these kids grow and develop. Um, and parents sometimes can listen and hear what educators and professionals are saying much better uh, than what their kids are telling them. Um, I do want to kind of breeze through this as well. Um, go ahead. <coughs> yeah, I mean, so basically, like, you know, this is just generally true for any situation in which you might you know, want to like bring a legal claim later or, you know, hold somebody legally accountable, but you really want to record everything, whether it's, you know, your kid or whether you're the teacher or the provider, record, you know, keep detailed notes of what's, you know, what the kid is saying is going on or what you know is going on and how um, they, it is uh, affecting them emotionally, anything they're saying, encourage the kid to also keep notes of their own depending on what their age is. It can be age appropriate, it can be drawings, it can be videos, you know, whatever it is that is the way that they'd like to express themselves, but it's really critical to try and record everything for two reasons. The first one is memory just fades over time. No matter how traumatic an event is at the time, memories get jumbled, dates get jumbled, times get jumbled, and, you know, you really want those all to be really clear when you're looking back at something later. And also because that, that creates a record which shows and proves that this actually occurred, right? And so, for example, if you are trying to advocate for a kid and you meet with an administrator, you know, try and get things in writing. And if you can't get things in writing, try to memor memorialize things in writing. Send them an email after a meeting saying, thank you for meeting me on this date about so-and-so. We talked about this and you said that, you know, you would do this and I said that, you know, this happened. And so you have this kind of record that's been created that something happened, right? So that you can prove that it happened later. Um, and the other thing to do is advocate to the extent that you can, whatever your position is, if you're a parent, um, you know, try and have meetings with the school on behalf of your child. Um, if you are the educator, you know, try to um, advocate internally. But, you know, you can kind of help kids a lot by doing that as an adult. 
because, you know, unfortunately in our society, adults are just listened to more than kids are. And so, you know, you have this real opportunity to act as a, as a, as a support for somebody and to really help them with the situation that they're facing. All right, so public accommodations, you know, I think uh, these are some examples of public accommodations. What I would say is that, you know, states, uh, these are, these are state-based laws, um, typically, and states define the scope of public accommodations differently. Some include schools, some don't include schools. Some include uh, certain types of businesses, but not others. And so it's really important to, to um, get us, you know, know what the state covers uh, in your particular state um, to, to know sort of how this, how this applies. But this is sort of generally <coughs> a list of public accommodations. Public accommodations are generally places that are, access that are open to the public, um, which includes businesses, restaurants, libraries, you know, things, places like that. Um. Yeah, and in terms of discrimination in those frameworks, um, I'm not going to kind of belabor the entire framework I talked about with schools. Um, there are a number of different federal and state laws that cover public accommodations. The con it's not been held that the Constitution has any protections, but you have federal laws um, like you know Title II, for example, is the primary part of the Civil Rights Act, which is held to protect against discrimination in public accommodations, and then things like the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Fair Housing Act, and different state laws that protect people from discrimination in public accommodations, either on the basis of sex or on the basis of gender identity. And each of those laws tends to have like different types of public accommodations that are listed within its framework, and so kind of like it's a quite a patchwork, like exactly what is covered in any particular instance. But the general legal theories are the same. If you have a sex discrimination protection, the argument is that discrimination on the basis of gender status is a form of sex discrimination, or you have some laws in states that say that you can't discriminate on the basis of gender identity, saves you the time of having to make that argument. You can go straight to why somebody discriminated against you. And so <coughs> this goes back to your question earlier about sort of religious liberty, and we have seen an increasing number of uh, legal uh, cases being brought asserting that affirming a transgender person uh, or, um, or in the case of Masterpiece Cake Shop, a gay couple, um, it violates my religious beliefs and you can't force me to do it. Um, and so many people are familiar with the, are likely familiar with the Masterpiece Cake Shop. There's a, a cake shop in Colorado that refused to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And you know, what, what the Supreme Court ultimately decided was actually a very narrow, decision, but ultimately their decision <coughs> upheld the long-standing uh, view of the federal courts, which is you can't use religion to discriminate. Um, and, you know, there's been, there's a lot of historical context to, you know, uh, for example, during the Civil Rights Movement, people using religion as a way to continue to enforce segregation or refuse to serve black people. Um, and really all the Supreme Court did in this case was said, look, uh, you know, when this went to the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, it seemed like maybe they were acting based on religious animus, which is a problem. Um, so we're going to send it back to them and just say, you know, you need to look at this again without any religious animus, right? But still upholding the longstanding uh, principle that you can't use religion as a way to get around anti-discrimination laws. Yeah, that being said, um I mean, this is a really big issue in American law and culture right now, right? So, you know, where we are, I think, just to pull it back a little bit, is that really what happened is that following, you know, the Supreme Court ruling in favor of marriage equality in 2015, the religious right kind of had to regroup and retrench. They lost, like, what was their biggest battle to sort of enshrine their kind of vision of morality into American law. And they had to kind of figure out what their next step was. And they decided that their two next steps were, A, let's attack transgender people, since we need a new group to stigmatize, and it didn't work well enough with the gays, so we're going to pick a new group. And the second thing they decided is, let's work on this idea that we can um, basically have an escape hatch out of all of these laws, because we can just claim that we have this religious liberty. right? And you know, this has, as Asaf just mentioned, a really long tradition. But this is the latest iteration of that tradition, and they're going for this new argument here that, like, hey, well, let's. This isn't racial discrimination. That's not okay. But it's okay to discriminate against people on the basis of LGBT status because of my religious belief, and that's somehow different, right? And the courts haven't really decided this issue yet, and so it is kind of like open and out there that they could go a different way when it comes to discrimination against LGBT people. They might decide that that's like more legitimate to do than discriminating on the basis of race or status. So we're, we're kind of in this like live moment right now where all of the energy of the 
religious right is really going towards bringing these types of cases and de developing these legal theories. And we are also, frankly, in a moment where the court courts are taking a more conservative turn because of you know the president's appointment to the judiciary, right? So there is a live possibility that they might be able to carve out certain areas where they can discriminate on the basis of LGBT status, and it's something we're really, really concerned about. So that's kind of like why we wanted to talk about it here. That like it, you know to alert you that this is an issue that we feel there is some potential that it could go the wrong way, and it could open up basically like this back door where you know, people are gonna be able to feel like they can discriminate against people in all sorts of different public accommodations. One example of that that recently happened, that did come out fortunately the right way for the time being at least, is a case called EEOC v. RG and GR Harris Funeral Homes. So this is a case um, that just came out of the Sixth Circuit, a decision came out uh, in March. Um, and what happened there is that there was a transgender woman who worked at the funeral home and she transitioned on the job. And she said, look, um, you know, I want to come back to, you know, I'm trans, I'm going to come back to work as a woman, so, um, you know, I just want to let you know. And the funeral home fired her. And she brought a claim to the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission, and the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission investigated the funeral home and found that they had violated Title VII, which is the Federal Civil Rights Act provision governing employment discrimination, by firing her for being trans. Um, and the funeral home basically tried to raise a religious liberty defense. They said, it was okay for me to fire her for being transgender because I have a biblical belief that like gender is innate and that like men are meant to be men and me women are meant to be women. And so they said, um, you're violating my religious freedom under some uh, federal law called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, by basically prosecuting me for firing her. And this case went up to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the circuit that covers like Michigan and Ohio and Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, and the Sixth Circuit rejected that argument. The Sixth, Cir Sixth Circuit said, look, um, we don't think that you have like an innate religious right to like discriminate against people and get out of you know generally applicable anti-discrimination laws that have nothing to do with religion. But even assuming that we agreed with you and you did have this religious freedom right, like what happens then under the Constitution is that you engage in something called strict scrutiny, which means that like the state has to have a really good act reason for what they did, and it has to be a, like you know a really compelling interest that they're trying to enforce, um, and this has to be the least restrictive means of doing it. So they, what they said was, look, that's what's going on here. The EEOC has a compelling interest in enforcing our federal anti-discrimination laws, and the, the, this is the only way they can do it by like finding that they made a civil rights violation. There's no other way that they can really go about effectuating the guarantees that were enacted by Congress in our federal anti-discrimination laws. So that was a really good decision because it kind of like confronted this issue of somebody really just saying, hey, I have a religious liberty reason why I can get out of this. And the way that our constitutional jurisprudence works, because you know we have the First Amendment and we're a history, we have a history of religious tolerance, and you know this being a refuge for people of different religious practices, is that you can't question the sincerity of somebody's religious beliefs, right? So you can't say like, you never thought that before. You know, people kind of say that these days. They're like, hey, since when do all these churches even have a position on transgender people? I thought you just came up with this. But even if like they said, I believe in the Church of the Flying Spirit, Spaghetti, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti says I can discriminate against transgender people. Legally speaking, you can't say that's not legitimate. You can't question the sincerity of their religious beliefs. The only thing you can really look at is whether or not they can act out on that basis or not. And that's precisely what the Sixth Circuit addressed. That said, this case is currently pending before the Supreme Court as well. And there is some chance that they might take it and go the other way on this, right? So this is a live issue that we're looking at here. Right, and, and I think, you know, uh, to go to your point earlier about, uh, you know, why don't we just say, well, it's violating my religious beliefs, you know. And I think that's that's where those are arguments that are made to sort of, again, show how untenable uh, a ruling would be if you were to say, you know, that a person who can use their religious beliefs to sort of exempt themselves from generally applicable laws in general. Um, and I think you know there is also a long line of cases for those going back to the schools context, where you know uh, parents have tried to uh, complain about the curriculum chosen by a school, claiming that it violated their religious beliefs. And courts have resoundingly held that you cannot do that. You know it does not that a, a school having, for example, in their library, Heather has two mommies, does not affect a parent's ability to. Uh, teach their children their own religious beliefs, right? It does not, because the school is not requiring them to affirm a different religious belief. They're not requiring them, they're not denigrating them for their religious belief. They're simply making information available uh, or teaching information. It does not affect the fact that when those kids come home, the parents can teach whatever information they choose. <coughs> uh, and so there is a long, long history of, of this uh, in the United States. One area that we're also seeing religious uh, uh, di discrimination or religious issues come up is in the refusal of care to trans people. Um, and so there are a number of cases around that that are kind of percolating um, and making their ways uh, through, through the, the court system. 
uh, in terms of what you can do about it, it's very similar in the school's context to the public accommodations context. You want to make sure that there's detailed records of what happened, how you felt, or how the person who was discriminated against felt. Because uh, you know, memory fades, pain fades over time, and so it's really critical to have an accurate uh, record of what happened and when it happened. Um, and again, um, at we regarding advocating, you know, reach out, you know, uh, to those businesses or entities that are uh, discriminating. Talk to them. Consider filing complaints with a state agency uh, that handles this type of. Uh, discrimination. There are usually a, st a state agency that enforces the state anti-discrimination law, and so it's a way to, you know, file a complaint without having to go through the uh, the the strain of filing a lawsuit, uh, for example. Um, and if you, but if you're interested in seeking legal advice, do that um, and talk to a lawyer about whether or not uh, there there is a lawsuit. Yeah, and I will say one final thing about the way in which schools and public accommodations are connected. And I think that it's that in both cases, really what the religious right is trying to do is push LGBT people and specifically trans people outside of the public square, right? Try to create a, a situation where kids don't feel comfortable going to school, where uh, people don't feel comfortable leaving their house because they don't know if they can go to the bathroom at a mall that they go to, they don't know if they'll be refused service, they don't know if they go to a hospital, whether somebody's gonna turn them away. And that has a really profound stigmatic effect and like, health effect on people if you can't get access life you know life threatening services but also just because you feel like you don't feel know if you're going to be safe doing anything right and that's really i think what they want they really want to make people feel like they have to live in the shadows and that they can't kind of step forward and be a full part of american life and so that's really i think the critical battle that we're facing right now which is like how to sort of educate the public in general that that is the effect of laws that let people get out of non-discrimination and that's the society that we lived in before before the civil rights era, where it was okay to openly refuse service, where people had to go to different restaurants, where people had to use different water fountains and different bathrooms and different swimming pools, and that we don't wanna go back to that picture of society. I think a lot of people today don't understand what that's like, and they say, well, what's the big deal? Go to another bakery, go to another barber, or something like that, without understanding how profoundly it can affect civic life if you have those systems and structures of discrimination. And I think that sort of educational effort is really vital to combating kind of this latest push to reinstantiate that kind of segregated society. Right, and just to go to that point, you know, it's not, it didn't involve a religious entity, but there was a case in Minnesota involving a trans guy by the name of Jacob Rumble, uh, who was discriminated against when he went to the hospital. And he had an infection uh, that was causing him se severe pain, uh, and he had very high fever, but he delayed care and delayed care and delayed care because he didn't want to be discriminated against. But eventually got to the point that he had to go to the ER. And then when he got to the ER, he was discriminated against. And, you know, um, he had an infection in his genitals, and the doctor performed a really rough genital exam, uh, despite Jacob saying, that's really painful, please stop. Uh, and, you know, the nurses misgendered him, you know, on the sort of whiteboard, uh, listing all the patients on the floor, li listed his incorrect gender marker, among many other things that happened while he was there. And so here, you know, he delayed care, which is which made his condition worse because he was worried about discriminate, being discriminated against. And then he went to the hospital because he couldn't not get care and he was discriminated against. And so it starts this cycle of really, you know, saying to trans people that, you know, we don't want you in civic life. We don't want you to be in public, um, which is very problematic to not only to us as a, as a society because we lose a lot, but it also uh, <coughs> has a very negative health effect on on trans people. But he won that case, I will say. Um, it's called Rumble. It's in Minnesota. He won the case in the federal court, and the court said that what the hospital did uh, to him was, under the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment, because it was a state-run hospital, and what they did was effectively torture. And so, you know, we are winning some of these cases when we can show uh, courts and society just how bad of an effect they have on people when they get discriminated against. Yeah. And yeah, so we were just trying to put up our information, uh, which hopefully will show up again. but. Um, uh, once it's up there, um, feel free to contact us if you ever have any legal questions or issues. And also we have a legal helpline where we help uh, several thousand people every year who come in and call. So if you ever have any legal issues that pertain to the stuff that we talked about, uh, please feel free to reach out. And um, if you have any questions, we're happy to take a few before the end of the session as well. Um, you know, I never remember what the email um, is. Is it like uh, legal? No, the, the helpline number is one 800 528 
6257. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get back to our contact information. Um, and you can always email us and we can always sort of forward it on to the person who runs our helpline. Um, you can use our contact information as well and we'll make sure it gets, gets through to it. But yes, we provide information and resources uh, to folks all across the country through that helpline. Do we answer every single question? That's great. Yeah, and th that, that is fantastic, but uh, as you s sort of suggested in your comments, it takes time, and so, you know, that's something to be, you know, again, I, I love suing people, so I n I'm never opposed <laughs> to it, uh, but, but, but for the people who, you know, whose lives that I, you know, are affected, it, it, can be, it can be difficult, and, you know, I mean, it's hard to sort of um, hear every time, you know, whoever, whoever it is that denied you care said, oh, we, did, we didn't, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the cases involves a, a hysterectomy, and you know, uh, essentially the line was, it's not that we don't allow you to do hysterectomy, hysterectomies at these hospitals, it's just we don't allow, you know, it's a, it violates our religious beliefs to sterilize someone who's fertile, or you know, we don't provide those kind of history, we don't remove healthy body parts. Where, where is the case law? Is there, is there like legal precedent that it's that um, <coughs> well, so I as, as I don't know if you saw what on this slide here, but um, these cases are all kind of in process. Robinson just settled, that was a hysterectomy case, and Minton and Caporn are also hysterectomy cases. This is kind of like a live issue right now, right? We, aren't, we don't really have a lot of precedent around the issue of whether or not a Catholic-led hospital can be refused to treat people if they're transgender. Um, we believe, based on long-standing non-discrimination principles, that that should be the case, but it is like an open area of law just because it hasn't been litigated very much, and because, you know, there was, I think there were a number of different factors, right? Um, one of them is that before there was widespread health coverage, a lot of people couldn't afford these procedures anyway, so most people weren't even getting them, and if they were, they were getting them in specialized places, so I think that's making this issue kind of come up a lot more, and then I think the other thing is that there is this push to get um, religious entities to sort of like realize that they should be discriminating and then like do it, and so I think that push is happening at the same time. Any of this settlement involved the hospitals changing their future policies at all, or not? I mean, there, there was, uh, under the Obama administration, uh, there was a transgender woman who filed a complaint uh, against Brooklyn Hospital. Uh, and in that case, the hospital did change their policy. But again, it's, it's relatively new and developing, so I think it's something to just keep an eye on. And I think, unfortunately, we're out of time, but don't forget to do your CEU things. That's the number. Um, and we're happy to stick around for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah.